Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I think I'm most excited about the fact that it's after 5 o'clock and I can still see across the bay. <laughs> Definitely know spring is coming. Thank you all for being here. I, uh, my name is Jerry Bowers. I'm the Director of Development and Public Affairs here at the MDI Biolab. And I see a few new faces in the audience, so welcome. We're really excited to welcome you to our second Science Cafe of 2019. Uh, these events, we've been putting them on since about 2011, and thanks to the support that we've received from all of you, they're continuing. We're excited to offer a wide array of topics that relate to science. The goal of these events is really just to engage the community in a conversation about science, and um, it's fun for us to think about exciting things that are happening both here at MDIBL, but also across the state of Maine, and shine a little bit of a spotlight on some of those projects. And, bring uh, topics to you that we think might be of interest. So also, we welcome your feedback. If there are things you'd like to hear more about, uh, th you know, topics that you'd like us to schedule, please let us know. We'd love to do that and love to hear what's of interest to you. So um, thank you again for, for being here. Tonight, we're super excited to uh, welcome the new president of the MDI Biological Lab, Dr. Herman Haller, to give a presentation on his specialty, which is chronic kidney disease. Um, and those of you who know Dr. Howard know that he's been affiliated with MDIBL for about 20 years um, and has maintained a year-round laboratory here since 2007. So although he's new to the role of president, he's certainly not new to the institution. Um, and I'm excited to have him share with you a little bit about his research, about sort of what he sees as some of the challenges in treating uh, cr chronic kidney di disease and associated uh, side effects of diabetes, and also tell you a little bit about his vision for the institution in terms of how the research here at MDI Biological Laboratory may play a role in helping to develop some better therapies for treating that disease. So, Dr. Hall. Thank you very much, Sherry, for the uh, very kind invitation. I don't think whether I can cover all that <laughs> <laughs> during the next hour or so. Uh, welcome, it's a pleasure to be here, especially to talk about the kidney, because on the one hand, mm -hmm. this place for a very long time was very special and still is special for the kidney. On, on the other hand, I'm a kidney doctor. Uh, in my other life, I see patients and uh, I have patients who ask about their kidney problems. So bringing this both together is what I've been doing for most of my academic life, on the one hand, <coughs> what's the problem with the kidneys in patients, and how can we do research and improve uh, kidney health? You can see from the first slide, and so the view, most of you are sitting in the back, you know, like always when I teach at the <laughs> university, <I> mean, <coughs> the front rows are empty, <coughs> but uh, you're lucky because normally I tell the student, Burr! move up front, but we're not going to do that. Uh, but you can see from the first slide, uh, it will be challenging. On the one hand, we have a patient, well, it's actually not a patient, it's a painting. Uh, he looks happy, but he's definitely a patient. I mean, we can see this from far away. There must be some problems there, um, and most likely kidney problems, but then you can see something which some of you may recognize as a kidney, and there is nephron written there. And then it becomes very complicated on the other side where there is a lot of some scientific, well, diagram. I can tell you, you'll understand all this at the end of the lecture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> now, um, Roy and Amy, you have told me that I can use these things here and it will work. It doesn't. It's always It's always my fault. Well, I don't know whose fault it is. It just doesn't work. No. Ah. Roy, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I told him to push the button. It comes after you, Roy. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is what we will talk about. We will talk about how important this 
diabetic kidney disease because it's the most important kidney disease we have, not only in the US, but also <coughs> worldwide. And then you have to bear with me. We have to understand how does the kidney function. What is wrong with the kidney in diabetic patients, diabetic kidneys and research on MDI, and you can see it's not only MDI-VL. I will briefly mention the other lab, the Jackson lab. <laughs> and then we'll talk about novel drugs. And I'll introduce you to some say, something which is for me as a kidney doctor, a revolution, and for you as patients, it will be very important to see how we can treat this. Now, <clears throat> we are all aware that diabetes is basically two diseases. One is the metabolic disease where we have high blood sugar, and we know about this. As a kidney doctor, I tell you who cares about high blood sugar. I mean, that's just a laboratory measurement. However, the other disease is vascular disease. Most patients with uh, high blood sugar, they develop complications of diabetes either in the microvasculature, in the capillaries and the small blood vessels, or in the brain, or in the heart, or in the periphery. And this is what people die of when you have diabetes. And I'm interested in small blood vessels, and I'm interested in the kidney. I'm also interested in the eye, I'm interested in neuropathy, but tonight we'll talk about the kidneys and uh, how are the kidneys affected. It's a very common disease. You see here the US, you see here 12 other countries, and we have an incidence of, this is end-stage renal disease, ESRD, we have an increase of roughly about 10% per year incidence, and here you see the numbers in millions of populations, and you can see that it's increasing, and then in countries with a high population, we have a very high incidence like in the US. When you look at the prevalence, then you can see that uh, this is diabetes only, and blue, and this is diabetic kidney disease in pink, you can see that from all, of all the patients, and these are large numbers, we're talking about <clears throat> almost 10% of the U.S. population with diabetes and with disease, only a third of these patients, the unlucky ones, develop vascular disease or kidney disease. Not everybody get, gets it. If you have very bad blood sugars and you have other risk factors, you are more prone to have diabetic kidney disease and vascular complications. Why it is a, it is a, it's only a third, we don't know. Genetic reasons, in Boston they have a large cohort where they look into that, and uh, so far we don't know. The cost <coughs> of diabetic kidney disease is huge. This is because nephrologists, kidney doctors, are so successful. We are the only doctors who can actually replace organ function. And we can keep you alive without kidneys on dialysis and with transplantation. But it comes as a cost. Even, you can see this here, these are all patients with diabetic kidney disease when we have then end-stage renal disease without dialysis, it's expensive, and the numbers go up dramatically with dialysis. This is not only because dialysis is expensive, but also you have, or patients on dialysis, have much more complications than without dialysis. And this is one reason why the NIH is now supporting, and I'll come to this, to this in my last slide, a big initiative to replace dialysis. We had dialysis now for 70 years. I think that's enough. We should build a new kidney. It should replace dialysis, but for the time being, this is how we treat very effectively patients. And this slide, <coughs> and we'll come back to this, tells you one, two important things. 
one is it takes a long time. Here we are talking years. This is 25 years. So on average, it takes 15 to 20 years when you have diabetes to develop vascular disease and kidney disease. That's a pretty long time, both for patients and for doctors. So when you're diagnosed with the metabolic disease, it takes quite a long time before this develops and it's uh, really a challenge both for patients and for doctors to think about the complications of diabetes over that time and really to behave and to control your blood sugar, your hypertension, etc. And then you see two curves here. One curve in green is the glomerular filtration rate, which is kidney function. And you can see that initially you have this increase here, a pathological increase. We have more perfusion of the kidney, and then it stays stable, and then it decreases, and here you go on dialysis. The blue curve is even more important because the blue curve is protein excretion in the urine. That's very important because when you have diabetes and you develop diabetic kidney disease, and I'll come to this and I'll show you some explanations for it, we have protein in the urine. The protein which we have most in the blood is albumin, so we have albuminuria. And in the early stages, we have microalbuminuria, which you can see here, mostly associated with hypertension, and then it becomes more and more. So the hallmark for diabetic patients, very important, is that they should know how much protein is in the urine. We fail. Doctors fail on that. Not only in Europe, but also in the U.S., when you're diabetic, you have to control your protein in the urine at least once per year. Now we have to talk about the kidney. Where are the kidneys? You know that you still have kidneys? Well, they are protected. You can see they sit here. There is the liver in front. They are hidden. They are in what we call the retroperitoneal space. And you can see this here where we have a, a, a section. You can see they sit in here. So they are nicely protected. In the back, you have, we have muscle, and in front, we have mostly the liver. So there are organs which are precious to the body, and we don't feel them. Sometimes we feel a little bit of pain there, but it's more a feeling that we have the kidney. The kidney is only hurt when we have kidney stones. And then it's not the kidneys, but then it's the ureter going down into the bladder. The kidneys, as the liver, has no sensory neurons, which is a problem. The heart we can feel, so when you have a heart problem, you have pain. The kidney, we realize only when they fail, and that at a very late stage. So I very often see patients, and they are, oh, because they have not been well controlled by their doctor, they come in with kidney failure at a, at a late stage. And now even more complicated, the kidney, and you can appreciate, because it's my favorite organ, it's one of the most complicated organs. You know, I mean, the heart, in comparison, forget it. You know. It's just a dumb muscle pumping all the time. But the kidney. <laughs> is really almost as uh, good as the brain. You can see here at the kidneys, there is blood running into the kidney, and then the structure which is, which is responsible for, for the function of the kidney is called the nephron. And the nephron consists, here you see the blood coming in, here we have uh, a nephron starting with a glomerulus, and the glomerulus is the filter. All the blood is going through the kidney lots of times during the day. It all goes through a glomerulus, and the glomerulus produces the first filtration of the urine. So it's a filter, like a coffee filter. <coughs> and then it runs through the nephron, 
first up and then uh, first down and then up again then down and then it's collected and then it goes here <coughs> into the flag. We have one million of these nephrons in each kidney. And you can see this a little bit more closely. The glomerulus is filtering the blood and then it goes to this complicated tubule and then oh, we have here elimination of substances in the urine. Now, what's really fascinating is, and here you can see this in real life, this is an electromicroscopy of this glomerula, and think of this, I told you it's complicated, but it's also beautiful, one million on each side. It's good that we have so many. Just on the side, the variability is relatively high. A lot has to do with genetics. The variability is 700,000 versus 1.1 million. And you can imagine that because this has to do with blood pressure, etc., this may be one explanation. And here I show you some more. Here you see when we, uh, these are the individual glomeruli, and here you see this complicated <coughs> network, what's happening in there. We don't even want to think about it because this is happening now as we sit here. I hope not everybody is running to the restaurants right now. <laughs> the fascinating thing is that the glomerulus is filtering 180 liters per day. Passively. The blood is running through the kidney, and here, at this point, we are producing 180 liters of urine. This is not what we are passing, <coughs> none of it. So the real beauty of the kidney is that these 180 liters are running through the nephron and the nephron is taking in a very regulated fashion almost everything back. Only 1.5 liter at the end of the day of these 180 reaches the bladder. So the real work is not the filtering, that's passive, but the real work of the kidney is in bringing all this, mostly sodium, and then the water is following, and all the other substances back. And this takes a lot of energy. If I give you three organs, the heart, the brain, and the kidney, which one is using most of the energy in the body? <coughs> How you expect the kidney? It's My not brain. the kidney. Brain. <laughs> brain. The brain. brain. <clears throat> well, when I mean, I'm not in a good mood and I talk to <laughs> medical students about it, and most of them drink from these large bottles during lectures these days, I tell them, I have the feeling that your kidneys are working more than your brain at the moment. <laughs> you have to sleep, you're drinking all the time. But it's a lot of energy we're consuming in the kidney and the tuber cells. And here you can see the filter, which is complicated. And here you see the tubules, and you can see these cells are polarized, and they do a lot of work. And we'll come back to this when we talk uh, about the novel medication. Now, this principle that 180 liters are reabsorbed, why do we do that? This principle was developed at MD Agia. This is from a famous book by Homer Smith. Uh, the concept is more than 300 million years old. Because this all happened when we crawled out of the water. Because when you're a fish, you don't have to reabsorb the water because you're swimming in it. But when you come out of the water, then it's essential that you keep your water in the body. So this is when we develop kidneys and when we develop tubules. And Homer Smith and the researchers here at the lab, I'm not joking, were the ones developing this concept in the 1940s that the tubular system is important because of this reabsorption. And you have heard stories, some of you, about that we studied here sodium reabsorption and the rectal gland of the shark. And this is all the same system investigating uh, what's happened here, and I'll show you 
This is Homer Smith. This is the grandfather of nephrology. I'm very proud to be here because he has been director here as well. But I can tell you, every kidney doctor on the planet, when they come to MDIBL and you tell them that Homer Smith has been here working, they are all impressed. And just one more picture because I like it a lot. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the 60s. <laughs> this is a reception at the NIH. That's Homer Smith. That's uh, Pitt. Uh, Pitt, he is the dean of Yale Medical School. And that's Shannon, the first president of the NIH. And he was president at the MDRVL also. So this tells you there is a long history here and there's a long history on tubules and the kidney. So what happens in the kidney? I've talked about uh, albuminuria. I've talked about loss of kidney function. When we look into the kidney, this is what a normal glomerulus looks like. I've told you that it's only a passive filter. Looks quite impressive, quite delicate structure for a passive filter. You see the basal membrane, which is where the water goes through. And very early on, we have this thickening. And then we have more cells here. And this whole thing grows. We have more matrix. And then we have this, what is classically called, classically called Kimmel-Steele-Wilson disease. But this is also relatively early. So all these changes are happening within our kidneys. And I have shown this here. While we are only having albumin in the urine. So this tells you why it's so important that when you see your doctor, you ask, have you checked protein in my urine? Because I just heard a lecture that this <laughs> is important. Normally, <laughs> he or she will have done this anyway, but it doesn't hurt if you ask. Now, <laughs> the filter, when it's damaged, leads to proteinuria, and this is damaging the kidney. But it is also important because this leakage which we have here is not only happening in the kidney, but it's happening in all the other capillaries in the body. This is a hypothesis not developed at MDIBL, but in Denmark, Costino hypothesis. So when you have protein in your urine, you also have leakage in your brain capillaries. And you have leakage in your heart. So it's good to know because when we look at the numbers, the moment you have microalbuminuria, your mortality goes up. It's doubling from when you have none. When you have more, it goes up. And when you have end-stage renal disease, this means that your capillaries are so damaged that it reflects also in the body and your overall mortality goes up. So the kidney is <coughs> very much linked to that. Now, do we understand, and this is one part of my research and has been for a long time, it's been part of my research here at MDIBL. This is the filter. We have different layers. <coughs> this is not what you buy as a coffee filter. It's more complicated. But it basically does the same thing. This is what it looks from the inside. These are... <coughs> Micro, uh, this is microscopy where we look uh, on the inside and you see how complicated this is. When you look from the outside, you see these green cells here. These are called podocytes. And we have been looking into the different layers and molecular alterations for the last 20 years. We are far from understanding it, but we have published a lot, we have contributed a lot. And we have used fish here, and this is a, our model here, zebra fish, because what we did is we labeled our albumin in the fish green, and then we challenged the fish to develop albuminuria, like what I've just told you, and then the fish loses the greenness, and we can see this here in the eye. This is the normal development of the fish, the eye, and this is when we take out some genes. So we can use this as a test model, which genes are relevant. And we have done this very nicely. However, 
We are not only using fish, we are using mice and together with Eric and others <coughs> we are thinking of using all the other animal models here to look into them. Eric, I have to tell you, I just gave a lecture last Saturday where I shocked the dialysis doctors in Germany because I told them that for the first time, there's only one publication, unfortunately, out of Germany, that somebody has used C. elegans to test dialysis fluid, which is really shocking. So it's only shocking because we have not been doing it, but uh, <laughs> so we use mice. We're not using mice here, but we're collaborating very nicely with the Jackson Lab. At the Jackson Lab, Ron Corsanche is the one who is interested in kidney, is interested uh, in how mice develop kidney disease, and we uh, work together closely. And one example is shown here. A couple of years ago, they did a screen where they found in their hundred thousands of mice genes which are important for kidney disease in mice. And then he came over and then we discussed these different genes and then we used it in the fish and I won't go into details here, but we could very nicely demonstrate that both in the mouse and in the fish there's a novel gene. The beauty of it is that, like with most research, it opens up all avenues because the gene is called kynorenin 3 monooxygenase. And it's regulating a substance in the gut. It's not regulating something in the kidney. It's regulating something in the gut. And these days, I can tell you, <coughs> and most of you know about that, this is very important because we now understand that the microbiome in the gut, which produces and uses this enzyme, is influencing all the other organs, especially the kidney. So all of a sudden, we meet with researchers from the tracks and we do research together and then we open, we have a whole new avenue of <coughs> how things develop and uh, new mechanisms in diabetic nephropathy. Now, how do we treat? Now, what, do we have, what do you have to do to keep your <coughs> kidneys healthy? After what we went through, how, how much should you drink? I mean, we talk just 180 liters. Do you think it makes a difference whether you drink two or three liters when you make... <laughs> One and a half. Hmm? Who, is, who thinks three is better than one and a half? <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> so, actually, it doesn't matter that much. But <laughs> more than one liter, and you, can, you can't keep your kidneys healthy when you drink more. However, what's really very important for diabetics is normalization <coughs> of blood sugar, but then the most important of all is blood pressure. You have seen these delicate structures of glomeruli, and these glomeruli are really delicate, so when you have high blood pressure as a diabetic, it destroys these filters. So <coughs> for a long time, normalization of blood pressure <coughs> has been it's very important. And although you may not be aware of that, uh, the, we have a major difference now in blood pressure targets between Europe and the US. You may have heard that the US about uh, one year ago, one and, well, well, almost two years ago, decided that the target blood pressure should be 10 millimeters lower and the Europeans didn't follow because we have so really serious discussions uh, about that. But for diabetics, it's still 100 below 130 over 80 millimeters HG. So in order to keep your kidneys healthy and to be sure that you're on the safe side, you have to know about the protein in your urine and your blood pressure should be below 130 over 80 and then you're on the safe side. Number three is, and I'll show you one example here, you are now experienced nephrologists already, so this is the decline of kidney function with high blood pressure. You start antihypertensive therapy, you slow this, and even when you're diabetic and you control your blood pressure, you can slow the progression of renal disease quite considerably. We can also use ACE inhibitors, which is 
a lot of patients are treated with that. And I was involved in that. That's a study we published in the New England Journal a couple of years ago, where we treated with high dosage of these so-called ACE inhibitors or sartans. And yes, we had an effect on proteinuria. You can see this here, but it was not very dramatic. A much more dramatic drug is <coughs> here under novel drug. It's already on the market. We are treating patients. And this curve is really the most impressive curve. This is <coughs> kidney function under placebo. And this is the improvement of kidney function under <coughs> treatment with a drug called empagliflozin. And these glyphloxins, com complicated name, we'll talk about this in a moment. These are SGL2 inhibitors, I'll explain this as well. And this <coughs> curve has not been seen by a nephrologist for 40 years. So that was a major breakthrough. Interestingly, if you allowed, <coughs> how did we get this data? Do you think somebody <coughs> made a, what we call a prospective study? where we tested this, whether this drug has an effect on kidney function, no. The drug was developed, and you see this in a moment, for the treatment of high blood sugar. That's relatively easy. But the FDA demands from every company now that they make a trial to demonstrate that their blood pressure, uh, their blood sugar lowering drug is not killing patients which I think is fair enough. You know, before you make a lot of money, you should be sure that the drug... So the drug companies carried out these safety studies, and they found it's not only safe, it's actually saving the lives of patients, and now everybody's excited. There are three major drug companies, I can tell you, they have now enrolled 20,000 patients in studies, because this is the biggest promise in cardiovascular medicine for diabetic patients in a long time. And you can see this here, you know, that's a publication from the New England Journal. You don't have to <coughs> understand a lot, but these red signs are all on the favorable side. So whatever, however you look at that, <coughs> these are very promising. And I've shown you this before. This is the decline of renal function. And when you treat these patients with two dosages of the drug, it's much better. And now it becomes complicated. Because how does this drug work? And for me as a nephrologist, it's wonderful. Because this drug is saving people, so it's also saving diabetics from cardiovascular disease. But the drug acts on the tubule. And only nephrologists and you now understand how the tube will actually work. Because when you filter here, you filter glucose as well. And normally, because the body does not want to lose all the glucose, it's reabsorbed. And it's all reabsorbed in this early part, the so-called proximal tube. So under normal conditions, we don't have glucose in our urine. And even when you're diabetic and your blood sugar goes up, uh, the kidney very effectively brings back all the glucose because uh, once we have eaten it, it would be bad to lose it. And this drug blocks the uptake of glucose in the proximal tube. That's a very easy principle. To be blunt, if you have sugar in your urine, you're not reabsorbing it, you're just peeing it up. That's what you dream of when you have your dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so this is shown here. You're filtering here uh, sugar, and we have here this SGL2. It's a sodium glucose transporter named number two, and number one, number two is the worker, number one, is for the fine regulation. And here you can see this. This is the transported glucose and sodium are transported through the cell. But the big question is now, and a very fascinating question is, how does it work? 
I mean, why, and now you can think of it, because you are as intelligent as most researchers, you have learned about the kidney, you have learned about the proximal tubule. I hope you're all fascinated that uh, this reabsorption is taking place, 180 liters, and uh, you go home more enlightened. But why should a drug which is blocking this and reducing the blood sugar saves the life of patients? And we don't know. That's the beauty about research. Normally, we do research on <coughs> small animals, and then we go into patients. Here is totally the other way around. We have a drug which acts in patients. We don't know how it works. So it may change the gene expression because the metabolism is altered. You imagine uh, this cell is seeing a lot of glucose normally, but all of a sudden not. may have to do with inflammation or fibrosis. And we did a study, one of the first studies done here. This is the glomerulus. This is diabetes. You can see the early changes here. And this is our drug. <coughs> we have not healed that, but it's much better. And when we look more carefully, we find that there is less inflammatory cells. This is all inflammation in diabetes. And here we have less. And then we looked at, very important, at the capillaries. And you can see when you're diabetic in your kidneys, you lose your microvasculature. I've talked about that. And when we treat here, you can <coughs> see there is even more than in the control. So astonishingly and fascinating, the drug which acts on this glucose transporter has an effect there. And then we look for <coughs> fibrosis. And you can see here, this is diabetes. And uh, this is under treatment with, this, with these so-called STL2 inhibitors. So at the moment, the drug is the RAGE. I'm lecturing in the US. I'm lecturing in Europe. Uh, we have boards, as I said, three companies are now competing because they have different versions of the drug, but it really is a revolution in the treatment. Mm -hmm. So the treatment is blood sugar, and the drug is used for that. It's treatment of high blood pressure, and uh, then we may reduce, with SGL2 inhibitors, gene expression, metabolism, inflammation, and fibrosis. So this is what we have talked about. You have understood how important diabetic kidney disease is. <laughs> I forced you into understanding how the <laughs> kidney functions. <clears throat> I hope you may remember at least some of it, what is wrong with the kidney in diabetic patients. But you will ask now for the protein in the urine, which is a major improvement. <clears throat> we have talked about diabetic kidneys and research on MDI. So we are working with zebrafish here and with other animals, and we are collaborating closely with the Jackson Lab. And then lastly, novel drugs for diabetic kidney disease, and all based on this work. Now, next, I did not talk about kidney regeneration. So I'm looking forward on one of the next occasions when Cherry is giving me the opportunity <laughs> to give another science cafe. <laughs> we'll talk about how to make a new kidney and our regeneration program. And you have heard about that before. My interest is really in the blood vessels in new kidney. Because I can make lots of things so far out of stem cells, but we all can't make blood vessels in these new organs. So that's another topic, and I'm looking forward to talk about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, however, we are all worried about that because for the kidney, it's not only the diabetes, but metabolic syndrome very early on, overweight, puts a lot of pressure on the kidney. You know, when you're overweight, you have also more body fluid, you have more perfusion of the kidney. So very typically, these children develop a stress condition, which is called focal sclerosis in the kidney, in addition to the <coughs> metabolic uh, disturbance. But yes, it can be used. It would be better to have more sports and more activity and less SGL2 inhibition. <laughs> and better diet. Yeah. Yes. And that would go for these ones. Well, the, uh, it can be used in diabetes 1 as well. Uh, and Oh, sorry. It can, sure, it can be used in diabetes 1 as well. With children? Well, with children, there are no studies. I would be more careful with that. You know, to, to control... Uh, in fact, I would be much more careful with that because uh, these children have uh, then metabolic problems also uh, and uh, shifts and... Uh, but. The nice thing is it's safe because you don't have hypoglycemia. Yes? In the preventing the uptake of the glucose, are there any other things that it prevents uptakes of or allows greater means? Is it, is it, is it unique to glucose? Yeah, yeah. it's very specific. It's really a very, uh, the research on these SGL2 inhibitors is a fascinating story by itself. Uh, the substance has been isolated from bark, apple tree bark. Uh, our ancestor knew this. If you chew apple tree bark, not a lot of people are actually doing this. <laughs> You're peeing out a sugar. Uh, we know that it's safe because there are genetic defects of this transporter. So. These patients, or not patients, but these people, they have blood, uh, uh, sh they have sugar in their urine all the time. You can imagine they are lean, but uh, they grow old, so it's not a problem. Uh, but the novel compounds are very specific and only for SGL2. And we have SGL2 only in the proximal tubule, nowhere else in the body, a little bit in the gut. Because here, there we, we, we have glucose uptake as well. Thank you. Is, can I follow up on that? What is it that makes, you describe some of the mechanism behind SGL2 uh, and, and the inhibitors and how it's saving uh, lives. Some of the other things that lower blood glucose, not so um, great in effect. Can you, is there something you can uh, describe a partition that says, well, this is, this is why these other things have sort of failed, and somehow, somehow the SGL2 yeah. inhibitors are... I mean, my, my personal hypothesis, and this is what we'll work on, is uh, it's a good thing that the kidney is reabsorbing all the glucose. However, in the early stages of diabetes, the kidneys have to work harder and harder to take in all the glucose you're excreting. So the proximal tubule is under a lot of stress. For a while, we are overexpressing SGL2, so it goes up about two, threefold, and we are absorbing, absorbing. And I think that the cells can't cope with that. You know, they are overloaded. Every day, 24 hours, glucose uptake and no rest. So uh, they start changing their gene expression profile. I think we generate inflammation just by the uh, permanent <coughs> overload of glucose reabsorption. And then we, when we give SGL2 inhibitors, they can relax for the first time in years. And uh, they change their gene expression profile, and this is how I think uh, it uh, changes. We're testing this. We're doing single-cell analysis. But if you want to have a take-home message for what the kidney needs and what the organs need, they need some rest. So when you eat, you know, for a while, all the systems are reabsorbing, that's fine. But then if they have a couple of hours, nothing to do, just a little bit of sodium reabsorption, then I believe this is healthy. It's more a personal view, it's this, uh, but you should not have uh, metabolic uh, intake all the time, but at defined uh, times. 
and in between the, the body can recover. Sorry. Do you know when the uh, trials might be finished or what that, when that might be available for people? <laughs> for diabetes treatment, it's already available. Oh. And doctors prescribe it here as well. You get it on the island. It's not an experimental trial. Uh, it's, uh, in, the, in the US, it's uh, Kanakliflozin by Johnson & Johnson. And uh, in the US, it's also by AstraZeneca. And in Germany or Europe, it's more Böhringer Ingelheim. And it's already going well. It's the fastest selling anti-diabetic drug at the moment. And uh, the good thing is really that so far from what I've shown you, it's a very beneficial drug as well. And the studies when it can be prescribed for kidney disease, they will take, I think the first study will be finished next year in May. Uh, and uh, then they have to go to the FDA, so it will be end of next year, uh, that they will know whether it will specifically act on the kidney. Yes? Do people drink too much water, coffee, tea? I drink throughout the day. It seems to be a big habit people have to always be uh, guzzling just plain water. Yeah, well, that's a very difficult question because I drink coffee all the time. <laughs> so, uh, you're actually uh, challenging me whether I have this is unhealthy behavior, uh, and I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I think uh, continuous drinking, I was so critical about the medical students, is a good thing. You know, I mean, you have to provide your body with continuous supply, otherwise you can't filter. Uh, this is not the glucose overload, it's just continuous fluid intake. That's a good thing. And one of the problems for failing kidneys we have in uh, older age, we know that, you know, you lose the appetite for a drink. When you're a child, you always drink and then it gets less. So we tend to drink less than one liter when we are older. So we should not do this. A continuous uh, intake is good. The reabsorption, although I was so critical about overactivity, when you drink coffee, there is not that much sodium in it. So you filter it and it goes. Yes. So how, the drug, how long has it been in use for treating diabetes? I'm just curious if you're seeing a lowering of kidney disease in patients that have been on that drug. Yeah, uh, altogether only for two years or so. So, um, I mean, truck companies are very active these days. So uh, what they do then is they bring in all the patients in big registers and they call this, uh, I don't know, everyday research or something like this. And uh, so there, uh, there are indications that this is the place, but these are uncontrolled data. So at the moment, we can't see a major effect. Yes. You said you were going to talk about some institutional ideas that you had. You haven't dealt with that yet. Apparently, I said that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think. Well, thank you very much. I think yeah, uh, you have seen some of that. I mean, first of all, uh, that uh, we are an institute where we have different animal models, and uh, one challenge is to bring us together uh, as a research institution. We have all our individual goals, uh, but when we have good ideas and we exchange these ideas, so it's about communication and bringing things together and then testing our hypothesis in other models as well, because this helps us and brings us new ideas. So that's, uh, we have not the focus of marine animals anymore, but we have, we have the focus of, uh, we don't call it comparative physiology these days, but basically we are comparing different model organisms. And uh, so that's one, uh, one issue at the Institute, which is very important. The other on the island is collaboration. I think, and we have been talking about this for the last, well, longer than 20 years, 
collaboration with the Jackson Laboratory, and uh, I'm very happy that on different levels, Eric's group is working on aging together with the Jacks. that uh, the island is so small, and it makes absolutely no sense at all that uh, we are not collaborating on a, 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 con a concrete level. And that's uh, what we're doing. And then um, we have these two strong strongholds that's uh, regeneration. You have seen a little bit in my last slide that we are interested in kidney regeneration. We are trying to recruit people here. We have a, a new senior scientist uh, recruited from Boston on kidney regeneration and uh, zebrafish, and we will also do this for aging. So uh, we will concentrate on these two topics and uh, we already claim that we are one of the world leading institutions and now we will actually do it. <laughs> and um, a big uh, issue has been visiting scientists. You know, you know that for a long time this institute has mostly been filled with researchers during the summer. So we still believe that this is a wonderful meeting place for people. I mean, you can't beat this place for doing science together. So uh, we'll have a visiting scientist program, but it will be more focused and more linked to what the Institute uh, is doing. And last but not least, we'll be cautious, but we have to move into biotechnology as well. We have lots of resources here. We have wonderful research groups, core facilities, and I think we should offer the possibility for young Mainers or other people coming from outside to start here small biotech companies on our campus together with the other researchers. So in a nutshell, that's what we'll do. We'll focus with the research. Uh, we'll have a visiting scientist program linked to the research, ongoing research in the institution, and uh, we'll move into biotech. And last not least, most importantly, we are dedicated to educate the next generation of young people in Maine and elsewhere. Yes. So, to talk a lot about kidney disease and diabetes, what are the most significant um, prevention measures a young family could take with their children? You mean in general for keeping to them healthy? Prevent kidney disease or to prevent diabetes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's really, it's uh, sport and activity and uh, healthy nutrition. And healthy nutrition means not, or it just means normal nutrition. I mean, th 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 this is all you can do. There are no special recommendations, not for, if you have a normal uh, food intake, you have all the nutrients you need to keep your kidney healthy. If you want to prevent kidney disease, I already, already talked about that. You have to know your blood pressure. I mean, from a certain age on, you should actually know, you know, wh what your blood pressure is like, and you should measure it now and then. And uh, if you have higher blood pressure or you have diabetes or other, you check your urine once per year. It's very important that if you are positive for protein, and I, I thank you very much for the question, I have to mention that that's not dangerous because you can have protein not only when you have diabetes, but when you have an infection. When you have been running 10 miles, you have also protein in your urine. So what you do is when you are tested positive, you have to test it again after three weeks in order to see whether it's real. So that's important. But otherwise, it's just activity, sports, and uh, healthy lifestyle. No SGL2 when you have a tiramisu at your. <laughs> <laughs> That's salt intake and keeping healthy. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I say, oh my God, because it's such a complicated question. I mean, first of all, salt is good. You know, everybody craves for salt. Um, we have a salt industry out there, and uh, you could become rich in uh, the <laughs> in medieval times uh, by selling salt. So salt is good. 
when we talk about the fish or us coming out of the water, how uh, we are keeping the water in, but basically we are not keeping the water in, we are keeping the salt in. The water only follows where the salt is. So salt is important, is central. However, because it's so good, it's like with sugar, we overdo it, you know, especially the industry, I can't help it. I mean, they, uh, when you don't cook yourself, but uh, there is more salt in it because it's tasty. And uh, so we take in too much salt. Now the big discussion is, is this dangerous or not? And um, there was a big study carried out uh, for the relationship between health and salt. And I have to add, the most important health issue with salt is high blood pressure. Because you can imagine when you have too much salt, you have too much water, you have too much volume, then your blood pressure goes down. So there was a huge study all over the world. <coughs> there were populations tested for salt intake. And since you cannot measure how much you eat, you measure the excretion in the urine and your blood pressure. And yes, in the Amazon, for instance, there is no salt at all. They have very uh, low salt intake and their blood pressure is very low. But there could be hundreds of other reasons why in the Amazon the blood pressure is so low. And uh, yes, in Greenland, they eat salt like crazy and they have high blood pressure. But in between, the relationship is not very clear. So uh, the results of this big study, they are in Washington, D.C., but you're not allowed to go there. You need permission from the people who uh, finance the study, and it's very difficult to get the permission for analysis. So the discussion, and this is why I said my God, is going on forever. Uh, some say it's only some people who have a problem in excreting the salt, not for everybody, but the ones who have a problem with excreting the salt, they become hypertensive when they eat too much salt. Uh, and it's an ongoing discussion. I've worked 40 years ago, what happens to cells when you expose them to too much salt, and we still don't know the answer. It's basically the same as a country doctor, don't overdo it. <laughs> well, I don't see any more questions. Yes. Thank you. Lots of sound advice there, I think. Um, thank you, Dr. Haller. I, I just want to remind you all quickly that our next Science Cafe will be on March 11th. And it will feature uh, Dr. Munir Hasham from the Jackson Laboratory, who is going to be sharing his research on cancer and talking about some of the new treatments that are on the horizon for uh, those who suffer from that disease. So talking about all these different options, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, all of these things. So it should be a great opportunity to kind of hear what's on the horizon there uh, from Munir. And if you've not heard him speak, he's a wonderful, dynamic, uh, engaging speaker. So it should be a great program. We hope to be at Jack Russell's, but stay tuned. We'll <laughs> see. <laughs> it hasn't worked out so far. Um, but we thank you all so much for being here this afternoon, this evening, and look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.